and we're now live. Good evening and welcome to the Licensing and Safety Committee meeting. I am Councillor John Porter, the Chairman of the Committee. I am supported today by my Vice Chairman of the Committee, Councillor Michael Brossard, and other members of the Committee. Most uh, members are present in the Chamber, however we do have Councillors Mrs Tina McKenzie boyle and Councillor Mrs Moira Gore attending via Teams. Sean Murphy, Julia O'Brien and Moira Fraser, as well as Donald Adams, are the officers who will be advising this meeting. And Joey Gurney is the clerk to the meeting. The meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube, so members of the public are able to follow proceedings. Before we start the meeting, I would like to explain, for the benefit of members of the public who may be watching, that today's meeting is being held both via Teams and with councillors present in the Times Square offices. Only members who are physically present in the meeting will be able to vote <coughs> on any items. Members joining via Teams can participate in the debate, but not vote. Please can I ask everyone present in the meeting area to make sure you have your microphone placed in front of you and ask you to make sure that you speak directly into it. Item one on the agenda is for apologies for absence. I've received apologies from <coughs> Councillor Nick Allen and Councillor Ian Kirk. Thank you, Joey. Does any other member bring any other apologies, please? Okay. Item two is um, any declarations of interest. Uh, the text is on the agenda, uh, and I'm not going to read it out. Members are quite familiar with that now. So if any members do have any interests, now please declare it, or during the meeting if you are aware, then please advise the clerk. Item three is to move the minutes of the uh, meeting of the License and the Safety Committee held on the 20th of October 2022. Um, can I ask for a seconder? We do have one matter arising, uh, and that's the Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Licensing Policy uh, the work on the policy is ongoing and it will be brought to a future meeting as soon as this work has been concluded. Does anybody else have any questions regarding those minutes? Yes, Councillor Mrs Brown. Councillor Tricia Brown here. Um, I went through the old agenda and I, I wondered about some of the um, wording here on page... Um, oh dear, this electronic circling thing doesn't work so well. Um, in response to a question of clarification of fees, it was explained that £20 was a fee for, to the council in addition to the DBS fee, first aid fee, practical driving test free, etc., etc. Um, now. I, I, I asked about whether it would be, I asked one, the operator who's over here, um, if it would be better to pay monthly, and she said she does, but by the time the uh, taxi, would-be taxi driver has gone through all these tests and examinations and is trying to get to work, it takes about six months to do it all and very often they drop out um, so <coughs> that all the the um, things that uh, we said we do about taking the geographic knowledge bit out and practical first Cape aid um, so on, uh, all the things that we can take out it would be really helpful to remove because uh, otherwise we're going to lose more and more and people are really struggling to, um, well, the operators are struggling to get drivers and it's adding huge pressure. So I wonder if that can be confirmed that we will do those things, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ms. Brown. Um, at the, we did hold a home to school uh, liaison meeting uh, and at that meeting, we actually made a pledge 
that uh, officers would look into speeding up the process. And I believe officers are still spe looking into speeding up such process. So um, we are hoping to have a much more efficient and streamlined process so that applications can be processed a lot quicker. So, and um, I don't know if Sean, want, you want to come on that as well? Uh, yeah, very happy to, Chair. So, um, I mean, we have actually, since we had that debate, I think we had it first of all in the Joint Committee and then obviously the debate took place here. Uh, I mean, we have been looking fundamentally at the process, particularly around some of the tests and things like this now, where there's still uh, elements around, uh, you know, effectively the things that sat-navs do nowadays and um, and, uh, and other things around around knowledge. and and. and, and one other element I think I've also asked that we have a look at is whether some of this stuff, like for example the test, because we do need to really check that people understand the conditions that, and the policies and, and the law around hackney carriages or private hire vehicles, as to whether that could be done in a different way, maybe online uh, and things like that, rather than people actually coming to an office and sat there kind of in, in exam conditions. Uh, but of course, you know, we, we do need to put safeguards in place around that as well. But you can be assured that if this is something that um, I, I uh, have had the discussion internally that we do need to look at. Thank you, Sean. Okay, can I have a seconder then, please? I'm, I'm sorry, Chair. If I may, I've got another question. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Um, that's page four again. Um, one of the bullet points... Um, says the initial application fee now covered a three-year license. In 2019, those fees were £45 cheaper, but only covered a year. Vehicles fees were proposed to increase slightly by £13 over the last five years. Now, without knowing the sort of original price of that, it's not, it's not clear you know, how much is 13 out of, I mean, if it was 20 pounds before, that's going to be huge. Um, could we state, please, in there that, um, you know, the, the fee now is, um, so it's only pre increased by 13 pounds. Would that be all right? We, we, the, the clerk will ensure that that is added. Sorry? The clerk will ensure that that is added. Thank you. That's minutes. lovely. Okay. Any other questions, please? No. Can I have a second there? Yeah. Thank you. Those in favour, please show. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Item four is uh, to if there are any urgent items of business. I can confirm that there were no urgent items of business. Thank you, Joey. Uh, item five is uh, any notice of public speaking. I can confirm that we've not been notified that any members of the public wish to speak at this meeting. Thank you, Joey. Um, <coughs> item six, members, uh, as members, we agreed on the uh, 3rd of February 2022 uh, Licence and Safety Committee meeting that officers would provide the committee with a verbal update on the work of the Environmental Health and Trade and Standards teams annually. I would therefore like to ask Sean Murphy to present this item. Sean. Thank you, Chair. I'll just uh, share my screen if I can. Okay. That's been done. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Is that, that sharing live, is it? Thank you, thanks, Joey. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. I'm very, uh, very pleased to um, to be here with the committee again. Um, so the purpose, really, of this presentation is to run through some of the other bits of work that are going on in the Public Protection Service, in the Council's Public Protection Service. So obviously, licensing comes to this committee, but I was just going to touch really on some of the areas of work that we're actually concentrating on at the moment in the borough, and in fact, you know, also in uh, West Berkshire, and, and in terms of training standards in Wokingham as well. So I haven't got very many slides, you, you'll be pleased to hear, but I've, I, I've just broken the service down basically into some of the various elements around that. So starting first of all with housing, 
Um, so we, we set ourselves a, a, a target, um, or the, the joint committee set us up a target in terms of priorities uh, to do some work around prior approval conversion. So these are the uh, properties that have been converted from uh, commercial to residential. Uh, and we have, a, we have a identified a number of premises that we want to look at as part of that survey. Uh, and that work is ongoing and we are we have started to conduct um, joint inspections with colleagues from the fire service and with um, with uh, building control as well uh, that will be ongoing again through the whole of next year uh, and uh, it is a kind of priority area for us but actually you, you know I was, I was i was thinking about this and we'll, we'll we'll come back to this when we talk about the commercial team it's been an interesting uh, year actually for the service so when you think about it when i started to think about last year when we started we were still in plan b covid runs restrictions um people probably uh, it seems like a, a lifetime ago now um, but actually in march um we found ourselves with new duties uh, particularly around the homes for ukraine scheme uh, so the, um, the, the the first kind of uh, arrivals, I suppose, uh, from Ukraine, guests from Ukraine arriving into the borough at that time would have been round about kind of mid end March. Uh, and we had a, a particular role to play in that, which was around uh, the accommodation checks. So there were two conditions uh, on, on arrivals, two checks that had to be carried out. So there was a DBS check that needed to be carried out. Uh, or, an, or an enhanced DBS check, depending on whether there was going to be children amongst the guests. But the other was um, an important piece of work to establish whether the property was suitable uh, for the number of guests that were arriving or whether there was any uh, related risks in the property uh, that would make it unsuitable. So that's actually uh, been a running theme throughout the year. Obviously, that work has slowed down, but between the two authorities, and I can, I will get you the Bracknell figure and circulate that if members would like to see that. But between the two authorities, I know we've 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 conducted around about 360 of those checks uh, since basically uh, March of this year, um, and um, and and although they, they have kind of largely uh, stopped in terms of new arrivals, what we're doing at the moment is working on. Uh, checks where people are being rehosted uh, within the borough, so uh, where where the where the council is working with um, other residents, basically to to rehost some of the guests as their six month period comes to an end and their existing host may not be able to continue. Uh, a lot of work again around housing standards and carrying out uh, inspections, and that fits in with the work around HMO licensing. And for the service, actually, 2023 is a big year uh, on HMO licensing. And the reason is, is that they are, by and large, five-year licenses. Uh, and I think, basically, the legislation changed to bring a lot more of those licenses in. I think it was around about October 2018. So towards the end of this year, uh, there will be a big program of uh, licensing and inspections of houses of multiple occupation in the borough. Uh, we're just kind of gearing ourselves up uh, for that. We've also been working through, um, the housing team have also been working through uh, the fit and proper assessments for regulated caravan sites. So the regulated caravan sites that we have are already licensed as sites, uh, with site licenses as, as many members will already know. Uh, but, the, but, the, uh, but the government brought in new legislation back in 21 around the requirement for site operators. Uh, to be assessed as to whether they were fit and proper people to to hold a license for the site so we have we 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 we, we started that work and obviously conducted that work some of that work into 2022 uh, and then actually uh, w through the joint committee we also updated things like the fees policy around caravan sites but also the private sector housing policy uh, which was very timely because of course towards the end of 2022 uh, the issue of damp and mould um, became a, a very big issue again uh, as a result of the tragic death of the, the toddler, uh, basically from um, mould, inhalation of mould. Uh, so um, since then, uh, we have uh, done a lot of work really to raise awareness of damp and mould. There is always a damp and mould season, as it were, uh, but as a result of obviously the heightened awareness, uh, we've updated our guidance uh, we've been working with um, uh, people like Silver Holmes as well, basically to discuss um, approaches to dealing with these things. Uh, and um, 
and encouraging people really to, to report to us because actually what we want to be able to do, even if there is no particular enforcement element or, or whatever, we want to be able to provide people with the best possible advice for that. Uh, we were required by um, the relevant government department, the, uh, the Communities Letting Up Housing Department, uh, to put two returns in. Uh, one of them was to state our approach, which we did, uh, and the second one was to actually basically um, to submit the statistics, which we've done or are doing this week, uh, which is the requirement. I think the final day is tomorrow. Uh, so we are submitting the, the statistics in terms of the numbers of damp and mould complaints we've dealt with in the borough. Uh, and um, you know what what actions that we've taken in respect of those. So we have set up a, a kind of system within the service to deal with the, the complaints we're getting in. We we kind of triage them. We ask people to send photographs in. Some of that we were able to advise just on that, but a fair number obviously need visits and things like that. So we, we'll continue to conduct those visits. So just moving on to the issue of I suppose environmental protection in its kind of widest form. Uh, we're, we're coming to, um, uh, I suppose, really the, the kind of end of the uh, original deaf air quality project um, that we um, set up um, across, in fact, not just uh, Bracknell, but also in, in, in West Berkshire and in Wokingham as well. So this was one of the legacy uh, programmes that we actually had with Wokingham uh, Borough. And uh, there was a couple of aspects to that. One of them is was the particulate monitoring uh, so the PM 2.5 monitoring, uh, which will become significant later in the year when um, the, there will be requirements on local authorities anyway, basically to extend some of the air quality monitoring that we do currently around things like nitrous oxide uh, but, and into, into particulates. So we're just waiting for the relevant government kind of guidance uh, around that. But also a big piece of work around um, idling uh, and vehicle idling. So we did some work with the NSL um, with you, your your civil enforcement people, basically, um, to, to look at that uh, and to and to raise awareness. And you will be seeing, actually, uh, these signs, if you've not already seen them, appearing at various points around, around the borough. Uh, uh, so uh, as part of that campaign, really, and although there are enforcement powers that sit around this, uh, our primary approach, really, is to just change uh, behaviours and views. Uh, so, um, so that that is a, a a big project that's been going on for a couple of years, uh, and um, and we will continue basically to to promote um, the whole issue around um, air quality and clean air. So, with that, basically, uh, we have to submit a, an annual status report in relation to the air quali quality management areas in the in the borough. Uh, we did that. The evaluation of the report was very positive. Um, and the work that was already being conducted, there are some things we, we do need to have a, a renew of that review of that this year, and we will we will look at basically our our air quality action plan. Uh, but actually, that goes to committee every year, the joint committee, I should say, who who look at the uh, DEFRA responses to the air quality reports. Another significant area that was uh, relevant to Bracknell Forest, we're also uh, required to uh, actually have a contaminated land strategy. Um, and we have updated the contaminated land strategy for Bracknell. It was a few years old now, uh, and uh, it w went through the joint committee, and I think ultimately it was signed off uh, by the executive uh, uh, here at the council. Uh, and what that really says is that we will deal with issues around um, contaminated land primarily through the planning process. So uh, environmental health officers, um, which leads on to the next thing that's actually on there, but environmental health officers obviously um, look at various planning applications that are submitted to the authority. Uh, they will look at the implications around all sorts of things from nuisance, but contaminated land would be one of those issues that they would look at and, and, and where appropriate suggest conditions and advise the committee accordingly. And then right at the, uh, we're just waiting for a, a result on the uh, on a further grant application which has been submitted to to uh, DEFRA uh, to extend the work that we've already been doing around uh, particulars. So I say actually going back to the uh, beginning of the year, um, you know, and I think it was I think this went through all the way through till about March. We were still in um, Plan B uh, COVID. We were still conducting um, the. Uh, 
the, the, the trace local tracing service for for uh, the weekend so uh, Brighton will obviously d during the week it was done within within the uh, within the authority but at weekends and all the way through the pandemic actually the Saturday and Sunday local tracing for Brighton was conducted by the public protection service uh, along with uh, anything else that needed doing so th the primary focus around the commercial uh, the work of the commercial team has really been the food safety recovery plan uh, and, and when I say recovery plan, so this is basically what you can imagine we've got a very big backlog of inspections uh, during the pandemic. We, we, we did go out and we did do some some inspections of higher risk premises, uh, but we didn't want really want to be kind of, I suppose, want a better word, kind of traipsing from premise to premise with the risks associated with that. Uh, so we followed the guidance that was issued by the Food Standards Agency. And we're now basically in the process of, of a big recovery plan to catch up with those premises. Also, during the during that period, of course, there was a lot of new premises opened and there was a lot of premises closed as well. Um, and, and we do have a focus on, on visiting all new premises uh, within 28 days where we can. And the reason for that is uh, twofold, really. I, I suppose the first thing is basically we, we want to be assured that they know what they're doing. Uh, but the second thing is actually a lot of premises, uh, food premises, actually do want a, a visit because they want a food hygiene rating. And, and that's very important. So, And that's another reason why we need to get back round the premises as part of the recovery process. Uh, because, because clearly um, uh, a good food hygiene rating is part of their, uh, their selling point. It's part of the kind of uh, creating consumer confidence. Uh, and, and getting people through the doors of the business. Uh, so obviously only part of that, but, but, it, but it still is part of that and, and, and they do value uh, good ratings. So a bit of work as well around, uh, well I say a bit of work, a lot of reactive work around food safety, uh, complaints, service requests, business advice, uh, health and safety referrals and notifications. So we do get notific notified of a certain accidents uh, you may or may not have heard of the system called RIDOR, but effectively it's a notification of accidents um, where uh, there may have been injury or, or, or people taken to hospital. Uh, so we get notified of those, we, we, we examine those when they come in and they may or may not uh, require further investigation. Uh, and also with the uh, same with the infectious disease notifications. So that would be things like um, Salmonella, Campylobacter infections. That's what we would want to try and do is to see whether there was any implications around food premises. And finally, actually event safety. And it's been a very busy uh, year. So um, so we were back, obviously, that we saw a big kind of boom in the number of events post-COVID. I mean, there was events took place all the way through COVID. Uh, but uh, the work that we do around the safety advisory group and event safety has kind of continued to grow. COVID brought us a lot more organisations to our door looking for advice. And many of those organisations have stayed, basically, and we continue to work with them to ensure that things go off uh, well. And uh, an example of that, so uh, obviously we had um, the Jubilee last year, so that brought us a, a number of other events. Uh, right now, we're gearing up to help support people uh, for events for the coronation. Uh, but we had some interesting ones as well in, in, in this period uh, here in the borough. And an example of that would be um, the Bracknell Town successfully getting through to the uh, to the first round of the FA Cup proper and, and drawing uh, Ipswich at home. So uh, we work with the club uh, and partners and everything else to, to, to make sure that an event like that uh, where where they would get significant the normal people and they would on a normal match day basically went ahead uh, went ahead safely which which uh, they did sadly the result wasn't perhaps quite what they wanted uh, but uh, actually it was a good game I did watch that on television so uh, moving on just to trading standards very quickly a um, bit of a focus more recently on the cost of living related issues so we've been doing works with uh, work on, on the council's overall response around scams and and getting advice around out to people basically to make sure that they don't become victims of crime by basically you know so areas things like uh, advising around things like illegal money lending scams and that type of thing a lot of work this year around used car sales we have been concentrating on uh, a lot of the premises where we've had perhaps more numbers of complaints coming in where there's been concerns around unsafe vehicles uh, being sold or other allegations of um, unfair trading. So we have carried out across the, 
the districts that we cover for trading summers, which does include Wokingham still, number of visits. Towards the end of, uh, well, in fact, during the year, but, but certainly towards the end, and, and even today, the issue of vaping and young people is, be, is, is in the news. Uh, and you may have seen there was a story today, I think, about the number of hospital admissions from young people and vaping. Uh, and we've done a fair bit of work around uh, the whole issue of vaping, not just from the point of view of enforcement. So we have we have a number of enforcement responsibilities there, which include things like uh, ensuring that they don't uh, fall into the hands of young people from, from shops. So there is an age restriction on them of, of 18. But also there is a uh, there, is, there are also rules about the uh, the contents of uh, vapes as well so there are limits to the, the amount of nicotine they can have there are limits to the amount of um, the amount of the, the size of the kind of um, the size of them the, there are limits to the number of I suppose for like puffs of the vaping thing that you can get out of a, a vape uh, and uh, as a result of that basically uh, we have uh, made a number of seizures including seizures in the borough of uh, vape vaping products that don't comply uh, with the legislation around that and I think that picture there is probably the top one is, is vaping products uh, I mean it's a problem it's not just a problem here it's a problem everywhere uh, the market uh, has been um, flooded with these kind of high strength uh, vaping products um, and uh, that you know it's not just here again it's around the world as well so we, we have been picking up those and uh, and doing a bit of a project there and we actually have a plan which um, is going forward as well to to work not just with uh, retailers but to work with schools and young people and everything else to raise awareness of that counterfeit goods has kind of reared its um, well it never really goes away but we've had a number of seizures again this year of counterfeit goods and they're being investigated uh, fraud unfair trading money laundering and i'll come on to that when i talk a bit about the cases uh, just like food safety, we also have a recovery plan for food standards. Now, for those that don't know the difference, food safety is effectively about the hygiene, the safety of the premise, um, and um, the the safety of the, of the, the product. Is it safe to eat? Food standards is actually basically a different piece of work, which is the, 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 the stuff around really around the quality of the food, the labelling of the food, uh, claims, health claims, allergens, um, contamination, all of that kind of uh, thing, uh, you know, and it's all part of the work that the Trading Sanders team do to protect the food chain, which also includes uh, animal health and welfare on farms but also, um, also taking samples and things like this of actual things like the feed, that affect, uh, feed the animal feed as well, because obviously all of that basically potentially ends up in the food chain. You'll see if you follow our Facebook uh, and social media profiles, uh, you follow some of the stuff in the, that we put out, quite often appears in the Bracknell News, a whole range of stuff about warnings around scams and, and, uh, and other frauds that are perpetrated on people. We extended, uh, West Berkshire did actually have a water safety partnership um, and we um, and that was set up following the tragic drowning of a young child in, in Newbury. Uh, the report went, I think, a year ago, didn't it, to um, the chairman, I'll remember, about a year ago to the joint committee uh, on, on the work of that and the decision was made by the committee to extend some of the work that we do around water safety to the borough here at Bracknell. And as part of that, we did hold a number of events last summer. Uh, so we, 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 we did joint, um, joint um, uh, sessions on, on water safety with the fire service at some of the events that were, were taking place. The days of action. Uh, so the picture in the bottom uh, right corner are, uh, is, is a picture from one of the multi-agency days that we did here in the borough. Uh, and that was working with colleagues from uh, Thames Valley Police where we did a whole range of uh, things from looking at obviously the police were interested in, in things like taxation, insurance, all of that kind of stuff on vehicles, commercial vehicles primarily. Uh, but also and, and also with colleagues from the uh, standards agency as well, driving standard vehicle standards agency. Uh, we were interested in particularly around things like waste carriers licenses. So this has been part of the whole uh, the whole kind of program of work that we've done around fly tipping in the borough 
uh, which has included everything from kind of raising awareness through to investigating particular fly tips where there may have been evidence associated with them and as I'll come on to in a minute, basically all the way through to fixed penalties and, and prosecutions. So these days of actions were actually set up um, multi-agency, um, very effective, found uh, a number of issues. I mean, it's all it's all in the public domain. A lot of this was put out through press releases, which is very much the kind of thing as well that also came out of the enforcement review that we, we do need to talk about what we're doing in terms of enforcement. And then obviously the work around fly tips, uh, fly tipping, uh, and that includes also some of the other work around some of the other environmental crime which saw us extend uh, roll out in fact the community safety accreditation scheme to the lexic and staff to deal with issues around fly posting uh, but also uh, if there were any issues around fly posting but also i think the other one was uh, graffiti um, amongst other things so just a few of the Bracknell cases from 22. I just quickly ran through this afternoon to through some of the reports that I had. I mean, this isn't a comprehensive list, but some of the examples. So we started off, we, we had an interesting case that related to a company selling a face mask during the pandemic period that weren't compliant with the relevant regulations. The penalty there was fine, 2,400. We got our cost back. We've had a... a few underage sales cases this year so that one particular one there was a an alcohol one where i think the, the two fines must have been one must have been the owner and one must have been the seller i suspect given the the difference in them uh, uh a uh, i suppose a, a, a an unfair trading uh case uh drainage company which actually was based down on the south coast but actually the uh, the victim the i think one of the earlier victims that we dealt with was in bratton it turned out to be a big regional investigation that resulted in uh, prosecuted uh, by us on behalf of the council, by Bracknell, Bracknell Council. He was uh, given an immediate 38-month imprisonment custodial sentence. Uh, underage sales of tobacco there. Interesting one was uh, some of the work that we've done around, actually that does have a connection with licensing, was around uh, the sale of puppies during lockdown. So it was a bit of a thing. In fact, it wasn't just a bit of a thing. It was a lot of a thing. Uh, basically, people buying... Uh, puppies uh, and uh, we did actually have amongst those uh, some unlicensed um, selling uh, but also in this particular case uh, and this was somebody selling in in um, effectively in a pub car park in Bracknell during uh, lockdown uh, with a whole range of uh, issues around misdescriptions and things like that uh, he was given an, uh, an 18 month community order uh, which included uh, hours of unpaid work, but also we were able to achieve, um, in that case, £4,750 compensation for the people that bought them. I think at least one of them may have died, actually. Uh, and then a number of, of uh, fly tipping cases as well, uh, and they've resulted. So we have issued a number of fixed penalties. Uh, the one on the bottom there, I think, actually was published publicised a couple of weeks ago, actually you may well have seen it on the Bracknell uh, website, that's the second uh, second fly tip caravan we've had in the borough, um, uh, So, uh, but there's a lot more basically that are still uh, under investigation and I'm sure over the coming uh, weeks and months you'll see more cases going through the court system. Uh, so really just looking ahead really for the service, last slide. Um, so we're looking at issues around income and budgets. So we've talked about the, 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 the licensing trade. Uh, you're about to talk about fees and charges. Uh, but actually, like lots of sectors, the trade, parts of the trade are shrinking in terms of the number of license holders. Uh, obviously, we need to basically balance our books in terms of um, making sure that our kind of income matches our kind of expenditure. Um, so we're looking at, at basically how we manage effectively a shrinking income um, from from areas like licensing it's not the only one um, so a bit of work around budgets we are now live uh, with our single cloud-based system uh, this is this has um, gone on for quite some time as, as anybody in the joint committee will know so we are now live with the new system um, 
and that basically is a system that we will be looking to deliver everything that we do in the service in terms of uh, where where all of the service requests are, are stored where all of the information around the inspections and audits and everything else that we do investigations but actually the significant thing for this committee is actually that we once it's fully operational and we're still just working through the final uh, things and it will make it a lot easier for the trade various aspects of the trade to both apply online pay online uh, and when it's fully functioning it will also s automatically send reminders and things like that which which will cut out a lot of the kind of manual interventions for the uh, applications team the workforce strategy uh, which also went to the joint committee in this very room i think probably a week ago today uh, chairman um, was um, is very much based around the fact about investing in our own people. So we struggle, like I'm sure multiple uh, parts of the council, multiple employers to recruit. Uh, so we have gone really all in uh, for uh, developing staff, our own staff as far as possible. Uh, we have three trainees have started in the last few months. Uh, we're interviewing for a fourth one on Monday and these are general uh, public protection type trainees who may specialise down a particular route later on but they're coming in at level four uh, to do apprenticeships and we have a number of um, existing technical staff that we're going to put through uh, level six apprenticeships to get them to the point where they're qualified as trading examiners officers and environmental health officers uh, and I would imagine probably sometime right round by around the the autumn uh, so the um, so the trainees have obviously started theirs, but we could have as many as 10 people plus doing basically um, professional qualifications through the apprenticeship schemes in the service. And that's how we're looking really to to manage um, manage going forward. And then the other thing really for us is, and we're, we're proud of this, you know, it's, it's we, we now have uh, high levels of customer satisfaction. We want to keep that. Uh, we've been working um, very, much over the last few years and, and we work with a lot of members I was saying to the chairman actually before the meeting started actually we do get a lot of inquiries in from members we're always pleased to get those in um, from our point of view we consider ourselves to be uh, an intelligence led service and in fact actually some of the best intelligence we get is from ward members so we do really need members to come to us if they've got concerns about things that are happening in their ward um, even if we can't do with it ourselves we, we we probably know who can uh, so, uh, really, that's it, Chair. I'll stop there. I'm very happy to answer any uh, questions. Thank you, Sean, for that detailed report. Many thanks. Uh, questions? Councillor Barnard, please. Thank you very much for that report. Actually, it, this, this one doesn't relate to anything on the report, but I was driving up um, the, the road heading on the other side of the dual carriageway near um, Kentucky Fried Chicken's KFC last autumn, and there seemed to be a huge amount going on involving cars and things like that so i'm just wondering if that was a public protection um you know thing there were lots and lots of cars for sale that were then removed on one particular day i i, I know nothing about it but it seemed very interesting and because they've been selling cars there for quite some time i just wonder if that's something that uh, falls in the remit of this committee at all or if anyone knows what, what it was Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, we, we run a range of uh, operations in partnership with other people. Um, I think probably that's about as much as I can say. Um, not not just in relation to to any particular operations, but but actually, um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go to Councillor Mrs. Gore that's online at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sean, for that presentation. Um, it's amazing how much, how many different areas licensing touches. But what I wanted to ask was back to the sort of start of your presentation about idling outside schools. Um, I know you said it was currently just a, a sort of making people aware of the situation. Um, do you think that there's going to be any requirement for quantitative data in due course, given the sort of high profile um, um, focus on ultra low emissions. Do you see that something as, as coming coming in due course? So there is, um, 
focus with the uh, Environment uh, Act, uh, the, the new legislation around particulate monitoring it's become. So a lot of the, the work up till now has been around nitrous oxide, um, NOx, uh, basically uh, emissions, uh, but particulates have, uh, have become uh, the, the issue that we're really now looking at. And particulates come from all sorts of sources. So it's not just basically, I mean, as, as people uh, are probably aware, it's not just emissions from vehicles, but uh, you've seen uh, new controls around things like the sales of wood, some types of wood and things like that used for burning. Uh, uh, but, you know, th there are many, many sources, you know, rubber from tyres, all sorts of things. So um, I, I, I do think this will be a, a big focus going forward. Um, I think we are going to probably be coming back to the authority to talk about where we want to go with monitoring longer term. Uh, we have been in discussions with public health colleagues around the whole issue of um, air quality monitoring going forward. Uh, I think it's probably really uh, just a really matter of saying watch this space. I think there, there will be a lot further discussion about this, Councillor Gore. Sean. Very interesting. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Atkinson, please. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you for the comprehensive um, presentation, Sean. Um, I just wanted to go back to the beginning of your presentation on um, damp and mould. Was did you discover anything on the scale of the um, the toddler um, Awabashak in terms of the level of of mould in in houses that you saw the survey information from? Yeah, I, I mean I've certainly seen pictures of some of the things that have been reported to us where there were significant levels of mould uh, in the property. Um, I mean, the issue of mould and, and damp is a is quite a complex issue, um, and in fact, the guidance notes, and I will share it with the committee, talks about some of the some of the reasons for that. Uh, but there is no doubt. I mean, that uh, some of the pictures that I've seen and some of the stuff that has been reported to us have have, have seen you know significant levels of mould in mould in properties. You know, even getting into things like you know goods in cupboards and things like that. Um, but I'll share the uh, I'll share the leaflet that's on the presentation with the committee. I'm I'm very happy to uh, to answer kind of any questions that you may have once you've got that. But mm -hmm. it is it is a it's a big education piece. Uh, so obviously some of it is is structural issues around properties as well. Um, but uh, you know and and there are lots of but ultimately a lot of it comes down to ventilation. A lot of it comes down to um, you know, kind of keeping properties warm uh, and things like this. I mean, as I left the house this morning, I, I looked in the corner of my own um, little little porch thing that I've got in my my, <laughs> my little house in Newbury, and uh, there was a bit of mould there in the corner. And you know, it is the coldest part of the house because we draft proof the the uh, draft proof basically from there into the main property. Uh, it's absolutely freezing there. You get a bit of damp in there, and obviously you get the mould coming through, and that's exactly what we've got. So it's 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 a lot about working with other organisations. Certainly, basically advising people, helping them sort it out, helping them to um, to deal with it once it occurs, uh, and where necessary, and where we believe it's as a result of of things. For example, a landlord should be dealing with. Uh, we will we will take that up with the landlord and get it dealt with. Thanks, Sean. Just uh, just to follow on from that. Um, so, so are you confident then that where you've seen some fairly serious cases that appropriate actions being taken even if that's just education yeah uh, an advice and uh, officers visiting and going through stuff with people and 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 explaining what needs to be done i mean wh what i would say is um that, that we would always encourage people to contact us you know so we have a responsibility around private sector housing and that would include um you know um uh, social landlords as well as well as private landlords uh, and we would also encourage people to contact us if they just want advice, if they've got concerns. Um, and at the very least, uh, we can we can talk through with them what it is that they need to do, basically, to remove uh, the mould from the property. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Councillor Mrs Ingham, please. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. So I'm the next one with the microphone. Um, 
Just uh, firstly, uh, thank you very much for mentioning your work with the wards and uh, just to say that um, uh, the PPP have responded very quickly and you've worked uh, very well with us, so thank you very much for that. Um, um, I just had a question about the food safety recovery plan backlog and how long you think it will take to bring us back up to date. I think 23-24 will be the final year of basically back to full recovery. We've made huge inroads over the last uh, the last year since since April. We've you know we've carried out hundreds and hundreds of visits across the air across the areas that we we deal with, um, and um, but I think 23-24. I can't remember exactly, and I will circulate something if I'm wrong just to clarify that. But 23-24 should be the year when we get everything back up to up to date. But but just be just be what I would say to residents and to to members of the committee is you can kind of be assured that what we're doing is taking a, a risk-based approach. Uh, so um, the ones that are being prioritised by the food standards agents that are being prioritised by us are the ones basically um, that need to be prioritised. Uh, and certainly if there's any, um, any, any complaints coming to the service about particular premises or any concerns raised with us, that would trigger the appropriate action as well. So it's not... It's not that we wouldn't go um, to a premise if they weren't on the list. Of course, we will always deal with anything that's raised with us. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Miss Brown, please. Thank you, Chair. I've got three quick ones, if I may. Uh, the damp and mould, I looked at the list uh, of things to look out for, and I, I, I don't know if I spotted a little gap, but please, could you put in... Please keep your extractor fans clean, not blocked with dust and stuff, because otherwise nothing's going to go through. <laughs> um, then the second one was the signs to stop people idling. I wonder if there's scope for uh, a question, waiting for someone, switch off your engine, because that often happens. Have you got one? So there were a number of designs, actually. So, I mean, this isn't the only one, as far as I know. There are a number of messages, and we, we, we did work to try and get something that was easily recognisable by the public and relatable uh, by, by the public. So I think there are different ones for different settings. What I will do is I'll share the full set of signs uh, with the committee. As regards the, the point about extractor fans, I don't recall actually seeing that in the guidance now. So, um, yes, top tip, I'll take that away and... Uh, and uh, when we revise it, and we, because it's mostly served electronically, we can make that revision as well. So I'll get that put in. Thank you. And, and one final one. Um, I do a litter pick weekly. Um, and one of the big things lately is vaping, um, not just the packaging, but the things, the actual vape, what do you call it? A, a vape machine, whatever it is. Um, disposable one, just chucked on the ground and I understand some of those have dodgy batteries in so this is a bit of a problem really um, in terms of disposal yeah I, I, I don't know about that aspect of it I mean I mean obviously the whole issue around vaping is a complex one I mean it's it's uh, for, for many people it's a way out of smoking uh, and with that um, with that uh, Obviously, you know, it's seen as, a, as part of the solution. That's why cigarettes are behind counters and vaping products are, are up front. Uh, but uh, there are issues, as I say, around um, uh, illegal vaping products, for want of a better word, ones that don't comply with the, the regulations. Uh, and obviously, the other, the other issue at the moment, which is prevalent and uh, is around uh, young people and vaping. So, um, but, but the issue of the, the, the safety element of it batteries it's not yeah it may well be the case it's not one i'm personally aware of but uh, again I'll, I'll pick that up with the team thanks uh councillor finch please uh, thank you mr chairman <coughs> yes it was um uh, uh, councillor atkinson was asking some of the question there about damp and mold but it seems to be seems to be a thing I, it comes up with me quite quite often with uh, with registered social landlords and what have you um some it's very difficult sometimes where people <coughs> Do, uh, are causing their own problems. Sometimes there has been a problem 
within the, within the flat. Um, I've, I've, I've got friends of mine who have had a similar problem, and they've, it's, it has been a problem sometimes, sometimes it hasn't. And there's been odd, the odd occasion, I think, where people who have actually used the damp problems to, to try and get themselves moved out of a perfectly good flat otherwise. I wonder, I wonder what sort of guidance could be around. How do you, how do you identify the mould? Something came out on um, Bratwell Forest uh, comms today talking about mould. Um, I mean, do residents often contact you directly about uh, damp and mould? And it just seems it's just a subject that seemed to, I seem to have been grappling with for quite a while. And I, have a, I have another question as well. Yeah, yeah. So residents do contact us directly, and and some of those are with private landlords, and some of them are with uh, social landlords. So uh, as as you, as you know, and the officers that are dealing with these uh, things are, are are trained and qualified to deal with basically housing standards issues, and and are able to carry out an assessment and and determine what the the possible cause may be. As they say, sometimes there are structural causes and why this is happening other occasions it may be to do with with as you say basically things like lack of ventilation and and some of the issues uh you know drying a lot of people dry stuff in the house and everything else and you know which is what a lot of people do which is what you know what we do <laughs> uh but obviously it's the steps that you need to take basically to stop that developing into a into a into a problem what we do know is that uh you know as we have been in discussion with some of the social landlords we know what steps they're also taking to assess their own properties uh, and and to keep on top of that we also know what processes that they have in place as well for dealing with things that come into them as a as a service and we, we do work as a as a provider and we do work very very closely with them as well uh around that so uh yeah i don't know I don't know on 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 the specifics of the point as to whether this is used as um, some sort of lever. I, I I don't know, but what I do know is that where people come to us, uh, we will assist them, and and I would encourage ward members to encourage people to come to us if they've got concerns. Right, thank you. The um, the other thing I was sort of interested in on there was the. Some, another question that's sort of asked about the food about food standards. Um, I mean, I saw in the paper recently that Tesco and other companies have recalled a lot of stuff. Some of them had potential allergens in there for people that weren't marked. Um, other uh, something uh, something else was there was hepatitis A was discovered or something. I wonder. Uh, I, I reminded in the past of horse meat, which was in things it shouldn't have been. I wonder what the drivers are for that. How how do we know where to look? What what how does how does a thing how does a thing work and. Uh, what what extra things are we having to do now? So th there's a lot of surveillance that goes on around food, um, and, uh, we, and we work uh, across actually the southeast with other authorities, and uh, and the, there's there's a couple of labs in the southeast as well. So we do we do t participate um, as an authority in in things like regional sampling programs and everything else to look at kind of targeted areas. Uh, some of that will concentrate on issues such as labelling and some of the claims and, and things like that. But some of that may also, um, uh, you know, I mean, so I was talking to somebody today about who, who was in the office, actually, and had a couple of, sort of food, items of food there. And I said, what are we looking at here? And I, I can't remember what it was now. It was... It was it was it was around whether a particular product w was was containing something it shouldn't, um, and uh, but we say we we do have this program. We'll look at things like meat species. In the past, we've looked at things like fish species, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but allergens is a, is a big issue. I mean, we've done a lot of work um, with businesses around allergens to to provide advice. We have uh, investigated matters uh, where people have suffered an allergic reaction. We actually go out uh, from time to time and actually do sampling. So we, 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 we say to them that we're actually, we have a particular allergen and then we will get the food tested to make sure that basically that they're doing what they need to as an organization to make sure that basically those allergens aren't getting into food where people have a polit uh, particular uh, allergic, um, you know, where, th where they may have an allergic reaction to a particular ingredient. Um, it's a big area, and quite often you'll see these recalls from the, from from retailers and, and manufacturers. I, I think the local news quite often run them. Uh, from what I recall, you'll you'll see a kind of bit of a roundup of the week's recalls and things like that. But and sometimes we participate as an authority in recalls, so they may contact us occasionally and turn around and say, "X business, which is a distributor of this in your area." Uh, has been identified. Can you contact them as a local authority and make sure that the product is taken off the market? Um, 
a lot of work around allergens. Um, yeah. Uh, Councillor Tina Mackenzie Boyle, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sean, we've talked about um, mould in houses. I've just had an experience. My alarm, my um, oh golly, it's not CO2, it's the other one. Carbon monoxide alarm went off in my laundry. What does PPP do to um, help people? Um, and do you do checks and monitor um, in whether there be um, registered social housing or just normal housing? What's the PP's attitude then towards monitors for um, housing? Uh, so we do we do do housing standards inspections uh, around things like HMOs. So we would be looking out for for something like that along with any other hazards uh, that were on the property. Uh, quite often a lot of this stuff is really kind of led by people coming to us whether that be residents or whether it be um, matters that are brought to our attention by ward members uh, and that's why we do uh, a lot of work really to highlight the issue so that people we can encourage people to come to us so that we can actually provide that assistance and carry out those assessments and as i say i think I've, I've in, in a previous answer we do also work with uh, some of the social landlords as well around the policies that they've actually got to deal with this themselves because above all else obviously they have you know all landlords have a responsibility potentially to, to to deal with this and and they do have processes in place as well to inspect properties yeah uh, and yeah so um w we are, we but we do we rely on people really i guess to to come yeah. to us yeah, yeah but do do, do Sorry, I, I think I've got an echo on the back of somebody else talking. Um, what about working um, in tandem with Royal Bart's Fire and Rescue? Do you work closely with um, with that agency? We, we do a lot of work with the fire service, uh, with the Royal Bart's Fire and Rescue Service. And, uh, you know, so uh, as I, split, I gave an example earlier on around inspection works that we do, but we have a lot of shared responsibilities with the fire service for building safety. So we have responsibilities mm. under, for example, the Housing Act uh, to deal with, with the safety of, for example, individual properties. The fire service will have responsibility around the common areas as well. So we actually have a we have a, a, a memorandum of understanding with them about basically how we will deal with this. Uh, there is a, there is a, a working group that looks at how we, we work to them and, and we, we, we have uh, named and known contacts within the service to work with as well. We got concerns. So yes, it's uh, that they're they're key partners when it comes to uh, housing work. Yeah, because this stuff is uh, sorry, this stuff is uh, the silent killer. It's a real real worry. Worried me just now now to find out where is this alarm going off, and it's in my laundry. Anyway, we've had plumbers in, and goodness knows what else. So apologies for coming in late to the meeting as well. Um, Chair, can I just say that Damien's had his hand up for ages. I will go over to Damien then. Damien. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I um, actually just wanted to respond to Councillor Brown's uh, question around waste disposal. Uh, it's outside of the scope of this uh, meeting, but if you wanted me to give her an answer, I can do that now or else I'll, I'll pick it up with her offline in terms of vape disposal. Uh, let's have the answer now, please, uh, Damien. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is that shops that sell vapes should um, actually take them back when they are finished with. Uh, I think we're finding in reality that's not always the case, um, but we'll, we're, we're kind of working on a project on that. But um, the HWRC at Longshot Lane will um, take vapes back uh, and, and reprocess them and recycle those that can be recycled. Um, we are also in the process of looking at other disposal outlets as well. Um, it's a kind of relatively new issue, but one that we're aware of is growing quite uh, quite fast. Um, if you are picking them up as part of a litter pick, please can you keep them separate from your main waste uh, and uh, we'll uh, process those separately um, and make sure they're disposed of appropriately because, as you've said, Councillor Brown, some of the batteries are are not uh, great and they uh, can be a fire risk so we need to process them properly and recycle them correctly thank you chairman thank you damien for that uh, response thank you very much very useful information councillor brossard thank you for that chairman um sean can we have another look at the sign that you had the for the engine idling 
Um, is that going to be the definitive one, or are you inviting alternatives? So I think this is just one of the designs. As I said, what I'll do is uh, I'll uh, circulate uh, the set of the different designs, because obviously different designs are, are suit more suitable for different locations. Fine. Have you actually drawn up a list, can I ask, of these suitable locations? I presume it's I, primary I, schools, I, secondary schools. So the signs are going out, so I'm guessing we have. Um, so if you would like uh, a list of the locations, the, the, mm. the, the first round of locations that we've identified in the borough, again, I can share that with you. Uh, two comments I'd make then, Sean. Firstly, obviously, I ma imagine they'll probably by and large go onto lampposts then, won't they, or telegraph yes. poles. Yeah, I guess can so. we have them high enough in such a way that the criminal fraternity, in inverted commas, don't find it a, a part of their collection, shall we say? I, I'd like to think it will be out of reach. Also, it might be useful, Sean, to have it at both ends of the school, given that obviously parents will be arriving from both directions. Yeah. So I think it's important that the message... Also, who will actually be doing audit shall we say is that environmental health uh, so so, so we so we in terms people? in terms of doing some of the uh, advisory visits and things like that that's why we've done some work actually with the councils i mean damien you can probably add to that as well i think we've done some work haven't we with the uh, civil enforcement uh, officers so i'm looking at damien on the screen <laughs> like if, uh, yeah, chair, if it's okay um, so, in terms of the signs, Councillor Brossard, uh, highways stipulate that they have to be 2.1 metres uh, high, so they are outside of, of reach and outside of, um, uh, you know, bumping into them accidentally. Uh, there, there is, uh, I was in uh, uh, sort of electronic communication with Councillor Mackenzie Boyle the other night, actually, on this, and, and there are some downsides to that in that they're quite high, so therefore not as visible perhaps as we, we might like them, but they're high enough to, to be out of the way of, of the reach of most people. Um, and um, yes, we have, uh, the Public Protection Partnership have worked with our uh, contractors for parking NSL and uh, arranged various training sessions with them. And it's part of their duties now to be speaking to people um, that they come across on, on their rounds um, who are um, running their engines unnecessarily. And at the moment, as Sean has said, it's very much about a process of um, education and discussion with those drivers. Uh, the NSL team have been given some leaflets with appropriate information on them. And uh, and so far, you know, we, we are kind of um, talking about education and, and discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sean, I've just got one quick question about air quality. Um, lots of councils are introducing ultra low emission zones. So how likely or unlikely is it, putting you on the spot, that Bracknell might have to introduce such zones to con control our um, pollution? For, from what I recall, I mean, the results, basically, the air quality monitoring over the last few years have been pretty good. Um, you know, so, I mean, there are always things you can do to improve um, air quality. So the, the idling stuff is just one of those. Um, but a lot of it comes down to all sorts of things like transport planning and everything else, um, planning generally. Uh, and we do look at things like air quality when we're looking at things like planning applications as well and the implications uh, around that. Uh, but from what I recall off the top of my head, and, and, and the status reports were published actually in the Joint Committee papers, actually I think they were published last, in the, in the meeting last September, so you can, you can look at them. Uh, I, I think the outcomes were pretty good. Um, what other controls the council put in, uh, whatever, uh, is really a matter for uh, for the council. But 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 as I say, the, it's 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 a it's a good and improving picture. Okay, thanks, Sean. And just one last uh, quick clarification. Um, I do believe that the idling fine is only twenty pounds. Is that still the case? Yeah, it's, uh, yes, I, th I think that's right, actually. I mean, it's about £20. It's, it's very uh, low, and I think even then, only if you refuse after you've been asked to stop. But this is, this is why the key, the key thing is, is it's never really been about uh, enforcement, although that backstop still exists, and the, uh, it's really about basically kind of changing public, um, the public's kind of uh, view of some of these things. And, and of course, the technology is changing as well all the time. So as well as this work is going on, vehicles are changing, uh, people are moving um, to hybrids, to electric vehicles, and also a lot of new vehicles. I mean, um, you know, newer vehicles will stop anyway. Basically, when you when you when you come to a stop, basically the engine cuts out. 
Um, so, uh, but it's it's the uh, yeah. I mean, the, the the work we're doing is just part of a package, really. And I mean, I mean, there are other things going on in the organisation. I'm sure. Excellent. Sure. Any other questions? Right. This this is a new hand. Okay, Tina. New new hand. Sure. I think this is a conversation be between Damien and me. Frankly, we, what we were talking about the other day, Sean, that the um, yes, we've got to have the um, signs at a fairly high height so that people don't bang their heads, poor dears. I mean, you can just see them, surely. But Sunnydale and Sunny Hill have done really well by or by um, having the pockets over bollards around the schools only but having the high level ones idling but they were really good they were um they had been um devised and um illustrated by the children in the local school so they were really eye-catching and making sure that you know parents do actually take their engines um down because not all of them um actually stop when you take the ignition key out or press the stop button um, but it was useful i thought that the children were involved and they were over the bollard so that everybody could see them we ought to try dane and we really should honestly have a real go at that rather than these things that are up there that nobody actually can see actually can i just come back on that so we have done things in the past where we have worked with schools around designs and and uh, and that's included uh, really kind of you know quite large banners on school railings and things like that the bollard one actually i don't think we have done uh, so again uh, that's a, a kind of a new thought that i'll take back to the team um as to whether again that can be an extension you, you're right i mean signs signs are only one part of it but some of the artwork that was produced by the children uh, in schools in the borough basically to to identify yeah. the issues around air quality was was really good um, sure. and, and of course yeah. as part of that you 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 educate as well and you educate yeah. children and they educate parents yeah i'll, I'll send you across you. Um, what sunny, sunny day has got damien did you want to come in on that uh yes thank you chair uh, just to pick up a couple of things um so uh, thank you, Councillor Mackenzie Boyle. I did send your picture on to the officer who's kind of looking after the project within the Public Protection uh, Partnership. Um, Fantastic. So uh, that's with them for consideration. So Sean, that action is, has been complete. Brilliant, um, thank you. And Councillor Porter just wanted to pick up in terms of your comment around the ultra low emission zones. Uh, and really that's within your gift, uh, if that's something that the council wanted to uh, introduced then uh, obviously you would have to consult on that uh, and you'd have to set up your parameters and uh, but yeah that's that's within your gift if you want, wanted to do that okay thank you Damien uh, as there are no other questions I'd like to thank Sean for your very thorough presentation Sean much appreciated and uh, again very detailed uh, going on to item seven uh, that's the fees uh, for taxi and private hire vehicles and operators. Uh, Moira, could you present, please? Good evening, members. <coughs> um, I'll try and be brief. The 2023-24 the uh, fees were uh, first proposed by the Joint Public Protection Committee meeting at their October meeting. Um, we brought them through to the uh, October Licensing and Safety Committee meeting as well. Members agreed to go out to a 28-day consultation on the private hire operator and hackney carriage and private hire vehicle license fees. Um, we wrote to the trade on the 7th of December explaining that all other fees would be included there in the executive consultation on budget proposals and the letter explained how they could engage with that process and included a link to the consultation. I understand that two responses received, were received in relation to that consultation but neither of them related to licensing fees. In respect to the statutory consultation, we ran a consultation from the 9th of November to the 7th of December. We put an advert in the Bracknell News and put notices up at Times Square. We also wrote to the trade and a consultation document was placed on the PPP website. We did receive three responses to that consultation. One of the responses was submitted on behalf of the, Black, of the Bracknell Hackney Carriage Drivers Association and was signed by 48 of the 53 drivers. We also received two further responses from local operators. In essence, the respondents have asked that the vehicle fees be capped at the 2022-23 rates, as they believe that the trade had not yet recovered from the pandemic, put footfall was down, 
and they were in danger of going out of business. The um, Local Government Miscellaneous Act 1976 requires us to come back to Council as we've received um, some objections to, to those statutory fees. Members are therefore being asked to consider those objections, which are set out in Appendix B to the report. It should be noted that these fees are set at a cost recovery basis, and therefore if members are minded to reduce them, this would need to be in the form of a Council subsidy, which this committee would need to recommend to full Council. This will need to be considered in the overall context of um, falling licensing income that Sean mentioned previously, as well as the Council's overall budget position. Happy to take any questions if members have them. Thank you, Maura. Uh, any questions, please? Councillor Ms Brown. Thanks, Chair. I'm not exactly sure where to raise this, but um, one of the operators said to me that uh, the, they are really struggling with getting replacement cars now because of the cost. Because during the pandemic, um, garages shut, you couldn't get new cars. Um, and so the, the price of the second-hand cars is going up like mad. A car that used to be about 9,000 is now about 15,000 and the accessible ones are even worse. The second-hand uh, version is now going up to about 30,000 to, re to replace an existing. Um, and one of the things that the operator pointed out was that for more expensive cars, like the Audis and so on, there's a discretion to have cars up to eight years old. Um, and that, if that was extended to the ta uh, Hackney Carriage uh, contingent of the taxi trade, um, who are only allowed to buy up to five years old, I think, um, that would really help them um, to be able to get second-hand cars at a, a more realistic price. They simply can't afford to replace vehicles and uh, it, it's impossible to get uh, replacements, so they're breaking down and even wheelchair accessible ones, are, it, it's just getting, getting extremely difficult. Um, and this would help them if they could just extend that five years to eight years for all the taxi. I wonder if that's doable. Uh, if I can just interject there um, it's part of our policy not the fees so that would have to be looked at in with our, our policy uh, Donald do you want to just clarify that please yes indeed and as was said at the start of this meeting that policy is due to come back before this committee once further legal advice has been sought on it so so th those sort of conditions and age of vehicles those can be discussed with the new policy and okay. as as, as uh, the chair says it's not about the fees can I then uh, ask to whom I should submit a written statement about that before it goes to the next meeting? Ch Chairman, if I could, if I, if I could interject, those, they, they, they're welcome to send the comments through to us. I, I do need to point out though that this committee agreed um, when the, when the uh, draft policy did come to this committee that you were happy to impose the Euro 5 and Euro 6 um, standards, which would imply, I think, cars ranging from about 2015. So it, the age of vehicles will be removed, but it would be replaced by, by conditions around uh, Euro standards um, because of your policies around um, cleaner air as well. Right. OK, thank you. I'll relook. <laughs> Thanks. I, th I think it's just it's fair to say, though, that I mean, the policy hasn't yet been adopted. Uh, so um, you know, I mean, it will be coming back to the committee, as, as Donald has said, and you know, there will be another opportunity to debate that when it comes back. Thank you very much. Councillor Barnard, please. Um, so I, I've, I've read carefully the fees that are put forward, and if I've seen this right, the cost recovery basis means that the fees go up and down in various years, depending on the calculation, um, and, what, if I, and that therefore um, that would suggest to me that the calculation is done on an annual basis, and, and, and so there's no sort of inflationary increase. Do you, you see what I mean? So I think for transparency, if we can just confirm that in this meeting, that would be helpful. 
Yeah, I, I mean, actually, the uh, for, I think it was last year or the year before that the fees we actually brought the fees down yeah. uh, and incorporated, and yeah, that was that. that was part of the uh, efficiencies that we saw uh, being derived from the new system uh, that when it came into being, and, and obviously the fact that basically a lot of people would be able to do some of this stuff online, there would be less, I suppose, people involvement in in the processing and everything else. Uh, the, the rise that's before the committee, or the in, sorry, the proposed increase that's before the committee now is, is simply one that relates to inflation. I can't remember, Moira will yeah. probably be able to nod ahead or, or otherwise, but I think it's about 8.4%, something of that order that it equates to. So it's actually even below current inflation. That, uh, that's helpful, levels. thank you. Yeah. If, and uh, Chairman, just to, to add, so the, in, in 2019, a renewal fee was £282 um, in... Um, in um, 2023 it will be 256 pounds so they, they haven't they haven't gone up you know some of the, the as Sean mentioned a lot of the fees actually came down last year I think it was a, it was a, around 80 percent of the fees came down last year when we anticipated the efficiencies from the IT system and the self-service um, element of, of that that's in um, part of software being introduced Councillor Finch please uh, yes, sir. So <clears throat> I'm trying to get a grasp of the, the ingoing, incomings and the outgoings on this. I mean, the taxi. There are lots of pressures on the taxi drivers. One of one of which is probably the uh, the pressure from Uber, which um, we're still going through a process. I think here of looking at national standards and and what and what the pressures are there and whether our drivers can move to that. The I mean, the drivers and the the, the costs is actually going out to the end user. We have seen the prices that taxis can, can are going up. I mean, I've noticed myself that going out, going to the town centre or going, going to a local pub has, has recently, over the last few months, gone from about five pounds to seven pounds. So they, they are covering some money in, in that end. And whether it's the, uh, the end user that's paying on the front end or the, or the taxpayer is um, subsidising, effectively subsidising the, the gap in between, um, there's, there's there's a lot of market, a lot of things moving about here. I'm not sh we are talking about inflationary rises here, which, and I think everybody's taking a hit on this at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, that's right. I mean, I mean, it's. Uh, I think that there's been two fair increases um, over the last couple of years, and and that's to recognise all sorts of things. Uh, you know, in particular the fuel price rises, uh, but as uh, but as. Uh, one of your colleagues just said also uh, obviously vehicles are going up and that's something um, the second hand vehicle prices as well um i mean we do do what we can to keep the uh the fees um where they need to be the other thing i think we also introduced was we we included a lot of the courses in that last time as you may recall in the in the driver's fee so they weren't having to pay because we knew that the, the 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 trade didn't like all of these well and you've got to pay for this and you've got to pay for this what we were able to do was to cap the uh the, the driver's fees at the current cost and incorporate the cost of the courses again through the efficiencies of the uh the new system uh, which have taken some time to to bed in uh so yeah i, I mean the fee for the vehicle the fee for the driver is one part of um, effectively, the, I suppose the cost of running the business, um, and you know, and you know, we and we we have an obligation to try and keep them as low as possible in terms of. Uh, but we also have an obligation. Well, we don't have an obligation, but we, we the the basis of what we do is around cost recovery for us, and and the cost the council are facing significant inflation costs, whether that's um, the costs themselves for the stuff that we. We buy in the systems costs everything that uh, associated with this obviously there are license fees that have to be paid for the systems that we use and of course there are salary costs uh, and and that 8.4 percent is is captures really a lot of those those things Thanks, please. okay we have <coughs> on page 11 uh, 2.1 is to note the comments received during the statutory consultation on variations to operators and vehicle licence fees as set out in Annex B of this report. 2.2 is to consider any amendments to the proposed operators and vehicle licence fees as set out in Annex A arising from the consultation. And 2.3 is to recommend that full council adopt the fees with or without, so it be without any modification as part of the annual fee setting process 
and that these fees come into effect as of the 1st of April 2023. Can I have a seconder for those, please? Thank you, Councillor Brossard. Those in favour, please show. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item eight is a uh, new section 182 guidance under the Licensing Act 20, 2003. Uh, this is on pages 15 to 20. Moya, would you like to introduce this report, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to say this is an item just for members to note. Um, it sets out the revisions to the section 182 guidance, which were issued by the Home Office just before Christmas on the 20th of December last year provides an update on the previous guidance, which um, was dated April 2018. It is important that members are kept abreast of all of these changes, as Section 4 of the Licensing Act uh, stresses that in carrying out its functions, a li licensing authority must have regard to guidance issued by the Secretary of State under Section 182. As the guidance is binding on licensing authorities, any departure from it could give rise to an appeal or judicial review, and it is therefore imperative that when this that that when this happens, the reasons for departure from the guidance are clearly stated in any decisions. Whilst officers will be on hand to assist members at licensing panels, it is important that members are aware of this guidance. The key changes were included in the December PPP Members Bulletin and are set out in paragraphs 2.4 to 2.213 uh, of this report. Um, I'm glad Donald's here because if there are any sort of uh, trickier legal questions, I'm, I'm sure he'll be able to jump in and, and answer them on our behalf. Thank you, members. Thank you, members. Any questions, please? Councillor Finch. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's a couple of things here. Um, Two point ten. The it was about full variation versus versus um, if, if there's a substantial change to a premises or should there be a new license. It seems like a sort of a value judgment really there um, of where. How, to let, has, how, how much does the premises have to change for a new licence to have to be to be asked for? It's, it, it seems slightly nebulous. I had another question as well. Yeah, I think I'll go to uh, Donald Adams for a response, please. To be honest, I think it, I think it's a matter of case by case basis as to as to as to the degree of change. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the new guidance only came out in December, and it is quite a tome. And to be honest, I haven't gone through it, it entirely with a fine tooth comb. But I'm, I'm not sure the guidance is, offers any more than, than what is stated in, in 2.10. Um, but I can look at that, and I can I can come back um, at the next meeting if um, or, 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 or or respond via the chair for for, for communication to you all um, once I once I look at that particular paragraph. Sure. Chair, I was just going to say, uh, I mean, obviously, we will have the annual member training for the members of the licensing committee coming up, and that will take place after the AGM once the committee is formed. Uh, uh, we'll ensure that basically uh, the updates to the guidance are included in those, the member briefings for those uh, members that are on the committee going forward. Will it also uh, be dependent on the size of premises? I, how substantive I, it would be? I, 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 to be honest, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so, so I mean, I think it is as Donald said. I'm sure, it, I'm sure, like lots of things in, in the in the licensing world, and particularly around uh, making decisions in the licensing world, it has to be done on a case by case basis, uh, and each case will basically depend on its uh, its facts and its merits. So, um, but we will we will uh, make sure that is something that's built into the uh, into the the next round of training. Sean, uh, Alvin. Yes, thank you. Uh, the other one was 2.12 um, about bringing licensing in line with planning. Um, <coughs> it says, for example, a developer is also responsible for the impact of, of change. Um, so that I'm just reminded of um, a, a, one of the panels we had a while back where uh, some people in Crowthorne moved into the defence of our house next to the Crowthorne Inn and complained about the noise from the pub. Um, I wonder what... Um, what quite what this guidance gives us in that in that kind of case well, again a case <coughs> excuse me a case, excuse me again a case by case basis but it, it, I think the new guidance um, really takes into account those sort of cases that you refer to councillor whereby um, you know there were existing licensed premises other people move into the 
nearby neighbourhood, etc. So, um, or, or above licensed premises. Um, so it's it, it, it's to encourage um, those developers to take their the existing environment into account. So uh, soundproofing and that sort of thing. Um, I think so. So it's a whole think of, think, think of the whole neighbourhood rather than, or the immediate neighbourhood at least uh, rather than the the, the the new development solely itself. No, thank you. It's just it's just one of the headlines one sees sometimes with uh, <coughs> with in in a paper with people moving next to somewhere don't like cockerels crowing. It just sounded like it's one of those kind of <coughs> tools that you might well use. The, the, I think that's exactly it. I think I think that this this new garden has been brought or that element of the new garden has been brought in because of those particular cases, um, because there's been existing premises, there's been new development around or above or beside. Um, and, and this this encourages or, or requires um, developers to, to, to focus into the, the, the uh, both both their duties to, to, to new owners or tenants um, but also to, to, to not to not be detrimental to, to the existing licensed premises nearby so basically to encourage um, cooperation really between the two parties so that they can they can coexist members any other questions please the item was for noting only, so it has been so noted. Um, before I close the meeting, um, Councillor Brossard and I would like to address the meeting. So, Councillor Brossard, please. Thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you, Councillor Porter. Um, this effectively will be the last meeting that uh, Councillor Porter and I attend in our capacity as Chairman and Vice Chairman, because as we know, on the 4th of May there will be new elections and after that obviously a new committee will be formed. I hope that many of you who participated in the uh, meetings over the years will continue to represent and support the Licensing and Safety Committee. For us really it has been the end of an era. I've been on the committee for 16 years. Uh, John will probably say longer than that in his yeah, case. Yeah. Oh, less time then, you know. Looking up your CV, I can't remember when you joined on licensing, but it was in those days, of course, in East Hampstead House, and it was on the fourth floor. Um, I think what has really changed very much has been the pandemic, because in the past, the taxi trade used to come in quite large numbers to East Hampstead House. Now I think they've actually benefited in some ways from Teams meetings that they can actually join in remotely. They don't have to give up their, their, their time to actually come to uh, Times Square, as, as it would be now. They, they, they can join remotely. Um, it, it really, I, I thoroughly enjoyed licensing and safety. I think it's been a, a very positive committee, and I think we've had, an, I think we've made changes. I think one of the things that I would like to comment on is the, I think, I'm choosing my words carefully, is the improved relationship that we've got actually with the taxi profession. Um, and it, it, it has been, I think, it, I, I believe that historically it could have been slightly adversar adversarial us against them but now I think we've listened to them we've worked with them if there are solutions we've come forward solutions if we can't have a solution we give the reasons why that can't be achieved and I think in some ways I'd like to single out Manoj who has, I, see, I think has been very good he's been the glue I think of the taxi trade he will actually consolidate embrace the views of the taxi trade so that you don't have 30 or 40 different opinions you have a consensus view and I think he's presented it very well to us. I, I have to say in some cases, and I'm sure Councillor Porter would agree with me, sometimes quite forcefully, but that is really the reflection of his passion that he has for the business and I commend him for the commitment that he has made. What I'd also like to do in closing is to thank the officers, to thank Sean, to thank Julia, Moira, and also Neem, who maybe is listening in on in Spain. If she is, then uh, Buenos dias, uh, Neem. But I'm saying, I I have to say, looking back, I found the support that we've had from Damien and Donald and the, really everyone who's actually made the committee the way that it is and the structure that we've got and the outcomes that we have achieved. So I'd like to thank you all, basically the committee, the officers for their participation, their encouragement, their engagement. And I will honestly say that I, I will miss it, but uh, I made the decision I'm getting old and maybe it's time to move on. Who knows, I might come back one day if I'm reincarnated.
I don't know if you want to say anything, Councillor Porter. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. I did ask you not to spe uh, steal all my thunder, but yes. Uh, I've actually served on this committee. I've had the pleasure of serving on this committee for 12 years in the last four years as chairman. Enjoyed every single minute of it. Uh, but I would just like to really thank members for their participation um, because it is a hard job, a lot of it's statute, and uh, it is very hard. Um, but I think praise has to go to Sean Murphy and his team of officers because this four years as being chair, you think it's going to be quite easy and then the pandemic comes along uh, and it knocks us. And, um, but Sean's team were able to adapt basically on a daily basis um, to all the changes as well as doing business as usual. And um, I'd like to thank Sean and his team on behalf of all the residents of Bracknell for all their hard work and dedication because that's what it is. It's not just a nine to five job, it is pure dedication. Uh, officers have to learn on the job and uh, we have officers on, on online tonight uh, and their input and their knowledge is valuable. Um, and if they don't know, they soon find out for you. Uh, and I do find that the officers rep respond very, very quickly to any issues we have. And I would encourage all members to carry on reporting because we are the intelligence that the, the, the officers can work on, not only just in licensing, but all departments. And without that intelligence, half the work wouldn't get done and our borough wouldn't be as safe or uh, as it is now. Uh, so, Sean, please pass on our thanks to all your officers, and that includes you, Damien, as well. I'm not forgetting you. Um, and if he's listening, Steve Loudon, who is the primary officer uh, when I first joined the committee, is superb. Um, so, and all officers that have been here before, uh, and Neve Kelly, if she's listening in Spain, thanks, Neve. Uh, your information and knowledge was invaluable. Um, so, again, thank you, everyone, for your efforts. Um, and it's been much appreciated. Right. Uh, now, uh, that is concludes all the business. Um, and I, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance. The next meeting will take place on the 22nd of June 2023, where there'll be a new committee. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Wilde now to 